Let's welcome another space co-pilot. Ground control to Major Ryan Osborne out in the atmosphere to tell us about spaceships. Hey everyone, Ryan Osborne here. I wanted to host a show and tell with you this morning and show off a generational tradition in the making. So my dad and I, approximately 30 years or so, built this Saturn V rocket. It's a little hard to see. And it's been through a lot of moves to a lot of different houses in that time frame. So it's not the most pristine condition as it once was. But what I like most about this rocket is that it actually separates into the three stages that uh, you would expect. Hey, so Ryan, it's pretty neat. If you could put that in front of you, because your your green your green screen is causing it to um... for a second and let us see. There, there we go. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Wow, that is a Saturn V. Wow. Oh yeah, it's a big one too. I'm trying not to break it. <laughs> and like I said, it separates into the different stages. So it's pretty neat. It was always a, a nice heirloom and always pretty cool to look at growing up. Um, space has always been something that our family revered and awed over. So uh, back in the day, we had a Dipsonian telescope that we would use to look at different constellations and celestial bodies. Um, I try and continue that tradition with my kids now. In fact, my 12-year-old wants to become an astronomer. So whenever we go out on camping trips, we make sure to bring the portable telescope and check out the different stars. And my seven-year-old daughter says she wants to be an astronaut. So one thing that we've been doing is developing these uh, little smaller scale rockets. And as you can see, they go in different stages. even equipped with a lunar lander. So we have these little small uh, Legos. Are there small astronauts in that in that kit as well? <laughs> Actually, this is uh, the same oh. scale as the rocket itself. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure about that. I think that there's probably a scale differential there. But, uh, yeah, she wants to be an astronaut. So together we went ahead and built these small model rockets complete with the different stages in the lunar lander. Um, she says that this is actually going to be her one day in her own space suit. So she's a pretty cute little girl. Uh, well, I hope y'all enjoyed a little glimpse of how space and space travel is enjoyed in the Osborne household. But with that, I'll give it back over to Jacques. Thank you all. Well, I got to tell you, Ryan, um, definitely encourage your daughters to be who they can be because uh, it, it, that does work. I know that from personal experience. Um, sign up your daughter in Todd. Spaceship design is is a deeply sought after uh, skills by our clients. Indeed, she'll she'll stay very busy if she no doubt. in Todd. <laughs> now, also, your daughter might want to know. I don't know if they're going to be into this, but I suspect they might be. They might want to know about the U.S. Space Force. I recently attended a meeting in Washington D.C. with the Commanding General of the Space Force. And I have to say, they have the coolest uniforms. So check out the diagonal bias on their jackets. I, I see Star Trek yeah, all over that. Uh, for sure. <laughs> and you know, AJ, joining the U.S. Space Force is not easy. Uh, people of all ages and backgrounds apply, uh, and the agency chooses the best of the best. Mm -hmm. Sounds just like Top Gun, Jacques. Indeed. So we have another co-pilot from the team here to tell us about our clients out in the cosmos. Hey, Sophie. Hello, Sophie. Hello, hello. <laughs> now, Sophie, we have several space clients that we always have that we've been supporting over the years. Can you tell us a bit about one of those very special ones, SpaceX? And I remember all standing outside last year to watch a SpaceX launch in Florida. Wasn't that fun yeah, and that cool? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so SpaceX is a pioneering company in the commercial space industry with a unique approach to space exploration. Founded by Elon Musk in 2002, SpaceX has rapidly become one of the most influential players in the space industry. The company's primary goal is to reduce space transportation costs and also enable the colonization of Mars. <laughs> SpaceX achieved numerous milestones, including the development of the Falcon 1, the Falcon 9, and the Falcon Heavy rockets, as well as the Dragon spacecraft. They also developed the Starship, 
a fully reusable spacecraft designed for missions to Mars and beyond. <laughs> SpaceX is known for its ambitious goals, such as launching the first commercial crewed mission to the International Space Station via the Dragon spacecraft. Mm -hmm. Additionally, they successfully have landed and reused rocket boosters multiple times, significantly reducing the cost of space it's travel. Amazing to watch. Yeah, and that's, yeah. A of, yeah. that's a lot of that's a lot of airline miles, right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Where can you redeem those? Yeah, you know, on you, SpaceX right. flights. It's that goes beyond global services. That's universal services. <laughs> yeah. So overall. SpaceX's innovative technology and ambitious vision continues to drive advancements in space exploration. And Sophie, we're happy to lend you our space helmets when you go to Mars. Uh, yeah, you can. Yes, you can do that. Up, there you, you go. There you, you go. Uh, you. We'll make it work. Well done. Well done. Heather, do you want to say a few words about Iridium, another one of our big clients in space? I do want to say a few words about Iridium, but first, Ryan, we've got to get your daughter to space camp. As a space camp alumna, I think she'll really love it. So let's get her out to Huntsville soon. Okay, let me tell you about Iridium. Since we're talking about space today, I wanted to talk to you about the Iridium Satellite Network. So the Iridium Satellite Network was developed in 1997. That's when it was first deployed and was fully operational in 1998. So just recently in 2019, Iridium completed an update to their constellation, replacing all of the satellites without disrupting service at all. So the constellation travels at about 30,000 kilometers an hour. Now, while most other networks are at a geostationary orbit at about 35,000 km kilometers from the planet, the Iridium constellation is in LEO, which is low Earth orbit about 485 miles above the Earth. So this allows stronger signals, faster connections, through smaller antennas with lower power requirements. And so this structure allows Iridium's low Earth, sat low, low Earth orbit satellites to converge at the poles. And so that allows for like those remote high latitude regions where no other satellite provider has coverage, Iridium can do that. So they use L-band frequencies to communicate with these users, and these frequencies are the most resilient to weather, because that's most important when we're talking about reliable communications, especially when there's adverse con conditions in space, uh, on the sea, or on the ground. Now, each satellite in Iridium's network is cross-linked with four others. So this again gives you reliability and resiliency as well as redundancy. So then the gateways processes the messages and then they get them back down to Iridium's customers, carriers, and the internet. So what has SMA done with Iridium? We have helped Iridium Space Development Agency related business as it establishes ground operations networks for Tronc 1 of the Proliferated War Fighter Space Architecture, PWSA. That's a great acronym for you. So the core operations and integration functions include enterprise management, network management, mission management, payload data, and the constellation monitoring that I just talked about that spans the ground, space, and all of the user segments of the architecture. So we've been involved with proposal management and EVMS. So that's just a little bit about Iridium. And now let me switch over to Major Tom Hernandez, who's gonna give us some updates on the latest space conferences. Um, yeah, good to see everybody. And I've been to a number of conferences recently uh, focused on space or aerospace. But first I wanted to give a personal comment on my own connection with this industry. It has always been in my blood. In fact, since I was knee high to a grasshopper. Um, and one funny anecdote that may make you smile. Well, I, I used to think I was a normal kid playing like all the other boys, but in fact, I had a strong nerdy streak. My parents had one of those big, massive, oversized world atlases. Nobody cracked that book in, except for me. And I would pour over that thing on rainy days whenever I had nothing to do outside. And I was mesmerized by outer space, by the photos and drawings of charts of the planets, of stars, of the Apollo and Saturn programs. And in fact, the nerdiness came out in some funny ways. Once my teacher at school, I was probably in fifth grade, said that Pluto, our ninth planet at the time, was furthest, furthest from the sun. I raised my hand and politely said, that's not true, teacher. She had some consternation, but I was right. 
Pluto's orbit is highly irregular, and there are times when it is actually closer to the sun than Neptune. Where did I learn this? From the atlas and from my preoccupation with space. So this maybe puts the perspective of one young nerd's, <laughs> your nerdiness into perspective. Anyway, as I got older, my fascination continued. Now for aircraft as well. I was inspired by my grandfather, who was a machinist at Lockheed Skunk Works in Burbank. And as I when I was a boy, he had the entire family mesmerized by the secret project he could not talk about. What was it? Those in the know could probably guess. 25 years later, he told me it was the Blackbird program, the SR-71 Blackbird program. He was one of the machinists doing all the special titanium welds and riveting that put this aircraft together. And it was the nation's fastest and most capable aircraft of its time. So we should never take these enormous accomplishments and the extraordinary efforts required to achieve these space goals. On to business. What makes us so successful is the fact that we do go to these conferences. And um, it's a busy time for me. I've been to three conferences in three weeks and I'm going to the Space Symposium in Colorado Springs net next week. Why do we do it? In a nutshell, they maintain current connections and help us make new ones. But we also go to the conferences to learn about the state of affairs and industry. For example, a couple of weeks ago, I attended Satellite 2024 in Washington, DC. This conference is mostly focused on commercial space, but many of our clients work in this industry as well. In fact, Heather was there. I saw Heather and her smiling face on the floor along with me. But what were the key discussion topics at this conference? Matters like satellite innovation, advanced connectivity using MILSATCOM networks, investment in up and coming small satellite businesses, launch service, artificial intelligence in space, multi-layered networks, and then something near and dear to Heather's heart, the, what is the future for satellite phones? I like this one. There's a great potential market for this. In fact, what they want to do really is take a phone like the iPhone, and it will you will be it will be agnostic whether you are connecting via satellite or whether you're a ground network when you make a phone call globally. That's what the goal is. One potential client of ours, Deborah Factor of Arabus Space, gave the keynote address, in fact, at Satellite 2024. I'll be seeing her next week in uh, Colorado Springs. The second conference I attended was more exclusive by invitation only event in Philadelphia called Wharton Aerospace. The Wharton School of Business has always been favorable to our industry, and this is the one of the ways it is reflected, a one-day conference with an intense focus on the financial and business matters of space. Some of those topics were the outlook for space investments and the role of private capital, strategic space growth, either organically or by acquisition, economic and supply chain resilience, and another uh, session on the business case for artificial intelligence in space. But the most fascinating discussions of Wharton were those about strategic agility. There were two panels on strategic agility. Um, on the business side of space, what this means is how you keep your company agile in a rapidly changing marketplace, how you respond to change, how you drive change, and how you adapt your company. It comes from changes in budget, changes because of war, disruptions in the supply chain, and disruptive te technologies. All of this affects a company's strategic agility. Of course, there's an application to the military as well. The same principles apply, but now the threats are not economic. They're protecting your people and your country. But the parallels are there. The world changes constantly. The threat changes constantly. Political forces change constantly. And strategic, strategic agility from a military perspective means being able to adapt rapidly and effectively to these changes. Because winning battles is a tactical accomplishment, but winning wars is a strategic accomplishment, hence strategic agility. I think my time is up. Um, that's all I have. Goodbye, everyone. See you next time. And I think it's over to you again, Jock. And a shout out to all of our new space companies trying to advance technology for future generations, who are many of our clients, actually. Indeed, Jock. Now we have a special announcement. We have an extra incentive for any associate who sends in a referral for business with a new space related company that results in has a result in revenues, right? In addition to the referral bonus you normally get, we will give a mission to the moon phase Omega Swatch watch. This watch is now only available, gonna be only available in Q2, and we're only gonna be giving five away. So hurry up. Is this from the BIOS uh, ceramic special uh, collaboration between Omega and Swatch? It, it is. And uh, this watch, Jacques, it features, you can see on here, 
the iconic dot over 90 on a tachometer scale. You kind of see it. It's going to be hard on the photo here. And the distinctive Speedmaster subdials. The watch comes with a lovely asymmetrical case. And people can team up to win the watch. With a group of seven, everyone could wear the watch one day a week. I think there are seven people right here in the office that could team up together and, and give it a run. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Those they're, are great watches. Uh, they're super cool. And I'm particularly impressed with the collaboration between Omega and Swatch. Right. Yeah. In fact, one of my favorite watches is my Omega uh, Seamaster. Yeah. Seamaster. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Now, how many aerospace tech companies are out there in the world that we even haven't even reached out to in space? Thousands, AJ. There are thousands of them. Now we have we have lots of space clients, but we there's a, space is a we big do. industry. There's no be, doubt about it's like, it. It's like reaching for the stars. Well, isn't it? Exactly yeah. right. All right. Now let's head back to space. Monday, April eighth, marks the complete solar eclipse, which is going to be seen here in North America. Now look at this ad from the New York Times. It's really a cool ad. That's a that's a yeah. lot of space for it, black it, black black square. It is. It is. It is. It is. Right. Jock, where are you going to be standing? Well, I imagine we'll all be standing outside with our eyes trained on the sky. Of course, wearing protective eyewear. Hey, guys. Whoops, whoops, whoops. Wow. <laughs> it looks like you guys are ready for the eclipse. We are. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Are you, you guys have got to be excited about this, right? I'm thrilled. Oh, I'm ecstatic. I'm over the moon. And, <laughs> cool shades, by the way. Yeah. 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 And those protect... Those protect your retinas, right? When you're looking at the sun. That's that's right. Yeah, exactly. At least we hope they do. <laughs> or, or either that, or we're, we're we're imitating three blind mice. I'm not sure which. <laughs> Thank you're you so much. Off those Thanks. 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 <laughs> now, Jacques, we're gonna watch for a good hour since that's the what time it takes for the moon to inch its way across the face of the sun. It takes a long time. Yeah, the sun's gonna look like a crescent, and then the light's gonna grow dimmer and dimmer, approaching a kind of twilight as the air gets cooler and then total darkness the sun will be fully covered by the moon now when the sun is gone there's still light that leaks out but it feels almost supernatural natural. indeed yeah it's like a dark hole cut out of the daytime sky well, a dark hole or a black hole <laughs> is there a difference well in this case <laughs> yeah there is the black hole is going to suck us all in right? right so in case i don't think the eclipse is going to suck us in that's a good space. thing I mean, yeah. could you imagine how freaked out that, you know, the, the people were in the middle? Oh, my God. Yeah. This? Yeah. Without having knowledge of the science. Right. Exactly. Now, when this happens, uh, there's still going to be a glowing wreath of energy around the edges. Absolutely. Yeah. So oddly enough, animals like uh, your dog, Buddy, Buddy, and Peter's dog, Yukon, sense the eclipse and become restless. Mm -hmm. They are unsure of what's happening, of course, but they know something is definitely going on. Yeah. But this totality is fleeting. The, the moon releases a fiery edge of the sun, and then the sequence actually occurs in reverse till it's finally over and daylight resumes as normal. Right. If you have never seen an eclipse, it's worth the watch. It, it is. It yeah. is. Yeah. Now, this one is going to be a perfect eclipse watching during certain par in certain parts of the U.S., but you'll still catch a bit of it, I think, even here in SoCal. Yeah. If you're down in Houston, you're going to have a bird's eye view of, mm -hmm. of the total eclipse. That, that's what the maps showed. Yeah. yeah. Now, we fully understand eclipses and can calculate the precise date time and location but at one time as you mentioned mankind believed mythical beasts swallowed the sun or that angry gods swallowed the moon yeah in korean mythology it was thought that the fire dogs and, and i think buddy would get get behind this took bites out of the sun during an eclipse and in china dragons were were said to eat the sun and the moon i think buddy would be scared of that dragon though <laughs> uh, you know he 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 likes the bigger the bigger they the are bigger, the, the, end, more the more he goes up against them you're exactly. right right that's a bulldog for you yep. now in ancient india an earthly demon traps the sun turning the world dark during a solar eclipse you can see a, a depiction of that yeah humans tracked the moon as early as 30,000 years ago it shows just how long we've been interested in space i guess as evidence is evidence boy i've got a little, little lunar dust there yeah um, <laughs> as evidenced by our ancient lunar calendars etched into animal bones yeah it's a little strange <laughs> the moon's orbit is is actually very very consistent at as everyone knows 29.5 days not 30 not 31 not whatever right yeah that's where our calendars are all jacked up. Yeah, they are and it's, it's easily tracked of course now for our ancient ancestors eclipses seem to occur at very unpredictable times 
Now, today, scientists, as we mentioned, can predict eclipses with amazing accuracy. Jacques, accurate to the second, just like the Omega Moon Swatch, right? And that brings us back to the Omega Moon Swatch. Nice, nice, uh, uh, you know, transition yeah. there, AJ. Everyone starts, uh, everyone start making calls to your friends and colleagues at space companies. I, I know you all know people there. As we mentioned last week, our amazing BD team develops new accounts by cold calling, staying abreast of, new, of news, as Tom was talking about, mm -hmm. networking and asking colleagues and friends for leads. Remember, your referrals are a way for you to earn additional income. And we're going to we're going to we're going to spice this up a little bit, add to the pot. And and you can get your very own Omega Moon Swatch. Now, that concludes our overview of this space town hall. With your help, we anticipate continued sales momentum throughout Q2. Remember, it takes the village. Yes. And all of this is possible because of your help. Thank you. See you next time. <laughs> See you next time. Back to Mars. <laughs> Infinity and beyond.